In the world, there are countless phenomena that defy explanation, mysteries that humanity has yet to unravel. Science tirelessly seeks logical explanations. Yet often, this pursuit falls short. Or perhaps, the true endeavor lies in concealing what cannot be concealed. Fort Lauderdale, Florida, December 5th, 1945. Nearly 80 years have passed since this event, and we still lack a clear explanation for what happened to the crew of Flight 19. I invite you to listen closely to this story and form your own conclusions. From the early morning hours, a significant mobilization unfolded at the Fort Lauderdale Naval Air Station, gearing up for a military patrol set to conduct an air bombing drill in the days ahead. A total of five TBM Avenger bombers, crewed by 14 men, were prepared. The mission was straightforward. Fly to the drill area located at Hens and Chicken Shoals, a section of the ocean designated for such exercises. The planes were to bomb the area and then return to base. Heading the drill in the air was flight leader Lieutenant Charles Taylor, who oversaw and coordinated the plane's operations. From the ground, support was provided by Lieutenant Hoover and his team, who, through the communication and radar systems, would maintain contact with the members of Flight 19 and the solid ground below. Despite it being a routine task, the team arrived at the base at 6 in the morning, slightly earlier than usual. Taylor, always the first to arrive, meticulously kept every detail in his mind. Yet, that day, the mission faced the threat of cancellation due to bad weather as a strong storm battered the Florida coast. Following protocol, the operation would be postponed until conditions improved. If not, it would need to be rescheduled. While the takeoff was on hold, the team congregated in a common room at the air base, resembling a classroom in size and layout. Chairs filled the space from back to front, with a desk at the forefront. On this desk lay the plan for the entire drill route, laid out for better visibility on a blackboard. Here, Lieutenant Hoover and Lieutenant Taylor outlined the bombing target, Hens and Chickens Shoals located 86 miles east over the Atlantic. Next, they would turn north, covering another 86 miles. Then, in a final maneuver, head southwest for 137 miles before returning to the base. The weather report, crackling through the radio, promised an improvement by noon. Meanwhile, the sound of heavy rain pelted the windows the wind narrating the storm's fury outside. Outside, palm trees swayed as the weather broadcast concluded, urging coastal residents to steer clear of Hollywood Beach due to the dangers posed by the storm. In the meeting, Lieutenant Hoover seized the moment to share with the team his extensive experience with these drills. For many, this would be their inaugural bombing exercise making the lieutenant's insights invaluable to those with less experience. Hoover was indeed regarded as a legend, though a shroud of mystery hung over his departure from aviation. Rumors whispered that he had fled with classified government documents intending to sell them, documents that purportedly contained information on the existence and possession of extraterrestrial life and technology. Yet, no one ventured to question Hoover about these rumors. Instead, he offered stories from his last flights off the Florida coast in 1943, when he was testing secretive features of the TBM Avenger bomber. Thus, this daylight mission carried an element of surprise known only to the crew. On that previous mission, three planes were deployed with just one crew member each, a deviation from the norm to maintain the secrecy of the technological advancements under test. Hoover, positioned at the table's head, began detailing that operation between sips of coffee. Speaking about that time seemed challenging, or perhaps he was contemplating revealing something previously unspoken as he paused frequently. At times, he would close his eyes 
appearing to allow his mind to drift elsewhere. Oddly, even his tone shifted and he avoided eye contact with us. As the pilots listened with rapt attention, someone in the background silenced the radio, allowing everyone to focus solely on Hoover's narrative. At one point in the story, Lieutenant Hoover ceased his discussions on aviation, or so it appeared. He began to recount a flight over the Bahamas during which he experienced convulsions. Mid-flight, he lost consciousness, unsure of the duration of his blackout. When he regained awareness, his compass was spinning incessantly. He had lost control of his plane, and inexplicably, he found himself over the Florida Keys. Yet, this place was anything but ordinary. The plane was imbued with an unfamiliar energy moving at an abnormal speed. Believing he was delirious, he looked down to see the sky below and, glancing upward, observed the sea ablaze. It was as though he was flying inverted. Hoover paused, each sip seemingly bolstering his courage to proceed. Many might question whether his drink was indeed coffee or perhaps an alcoholic concoction. Raising his head once more, he met our gaze, ready to divulge further details. However, Lieutenant Hartman abruptly intervened. Stop, Hoover, that's enough. We need to concentrate on today's mission. Ignoring him, Hoover set his cup on the desk and, with a direct stare at Hartman, continued that, upon regaining consciousness, he was severely disoriented. Fragmented transmissions crackled through his radio. The control base inquired about his whereabouts. He could only describe encountering some sort of portal, which he exited by reducing his plane's altitude to sea level, whereupon he re-established radio communication. Clearly, something significant had transpired between Hartman and Hoover, as evidenced by Hoover concluding his tale with the revelation that Hartman was the first to locate his plane upon exiting the portal, escorting him back to the base. This tale was a widely known secret, and the peculiar circumstances did not escape notice. It was common knowledge that Hoover's retirement was coerced, yet no one could recall such palpable tension between the two lieutenants since that incident. The room fell into silence once Hoover concluded his monologue. Hartman exited without a word, his expression not one of irritation, but it was clear he would have preferred another time to share his side of the story. In the ensuing quiet, the lieutenant stood and moved towards the window, observing the transition from storm to a mere drizzle. Hoover remarked, Today will be a good day to fly. Lieutenant Taylor was next to break the silence. It was 11.30 a.m., and the weather showed signs of clearing. The operation was scheduled to commence at 2 p.m. With no time to waste, Taylor assembled his team for a brief talk before initiating the pre-flight protocol. Hoover's insights were thought-provoking, yet today, we must set them aside. For some of you, this marks your inaugural flight. I wish you an enjoyable experience. Let's accomplish our mission and return safely. Just then, Hoover stepped back into the room, cutting into Taylor's address. My aim isn't to unsettle you. You're well aware of your duties above. Just remember what I shared. No one else here would have divulged that. Fly safely. This interjection stirred some confusion. Nonetheless, Taylor rallied his team. It was time to leap into action. Stepping outside, the shift in weather was palpable. The sun beamed down and a refreshing breeze followed the rain. The planes poised on the runway exuded a formidable presence, with the team primed for takeoff. Taylor was the first to climb into his aircraft, yet would be the last to ascend into the sky. With preparations complete, Lieutenant Hoover signaled the go-ahead for takeoff, which proceeded without a hitch. Once airborne, the squadron established communication with the control tower, receiving confirmation that their transmissions were crystal clear. To minimize any potential confusion, they were instructed to check in every 20 to 30 minutes to ensure ongoing contact. From the base, 
the radar screen displayed five blips moving away from the coast toward Hens and Chicken Shoal. By 3.15, Taylor declared they were in position for the bombing run. The squadron, aligned and at the appropriate altitude, received clearance from the control tower and successfully released their payloads over hens and chickens with pinpoint accuracy. 20 minutes after the operation, all pilots reported their successful bomb drops, marking the exercise a triumph. Outstanding execution. Flight 19. Time to return to base. Proceed as briefed. This is when the team's true mission began. Communication was lost for 40 minutes. At 4 in the afternoon in the control tower, an exchange of communications between the planes was overheard. One of the pilots said, I don't know where we are. I think we got lost after the last turn. Once more, communication was lost. Lieutenant Hoover attempted to reach Taylor and the rest of the team without success. The radar ceased showing the aircraft's location as expected. They could only maintain contact through radio. Without intending to cause panic but preparing for the worst, Lieutenant Hoover ordered a rescue plane to be readied, specifically a PBM Mariner with a capacity for 13 crew members. Even though the plane still had ample fuel to return to base, the silence turned toxic, causing Lieutenant Hoover to relive the worst moment of his career in the air. With 10 minutes remaining until 5 in the afternoon, there was again a sign of life. This time, the radar detected one of the planes flying over the Bahamas. Bomber number two, report. We've located you over the Bahamas. What's going on? However, the return of communication was just static. The radio was distorted as if something was interfering with the signal. Suddenly, unrecognizable sounds were heard, clearly not of human origin. And then the communication was cut off once again. Ten minutes later, Lieutenant Taylor was heard over the communication system, triggering maximum alert. His voice didn't sound natural. Instead, he sounded resigned, saying, I don't think we'll make it. Lieutenant Hoover immediately ordered the rescuers to depart from the base, escalating the situation. The Air Forces decided to inform the presidency about the ongoing events sensing a tragedy that could stir national upheaval. Ten minutes later, the rescue mission was airborne. The weather remained optimal, though some clouds impeded visibility. Lieutenant Hoover sought immediate communication with the control tower to assess the situation and make swift decisions, while communication systems endeavored to re-establish contact with the crew of Flight 19. At that time, the armed forces had 27 people in the air, grappling with the immense challenge of finding any trace. It was only known that Taylor's plane was over the Bahamas, but the whereabouts of the other four planes remained a mystery. Given fuel constraints, it was conjectured that some might have made water landings or, in a dire scenario, crashed. Almost half an hour after the rescue mission launched, they report a sighting. In the distance, they spotted an object. The control tower requested identification, and the report returned that it seemed to be a military aircraft, yet identification was unclear. The object slowly lost altitude. Intriguingly, the radar could track the rescue aircraft but not the other object, which remained invisible on radar screens. Similarly, attempts to communicate with that aircraft were met with silence. The other four aircraft also remained unaccounted for. The rescue plane drew near, and they finally realized it was Taylor's plane. Though some aspects were markedly different, the plane's color was altered, and it looked worn, as if it had been airborne for years without respite. The wings and propellers were tinged with rust. The pilot seemingly Taylor remained still, even as the rescue plane closes in. Then something inexplicable occurred. Taylor's plane vanished into a cloud bank, eluding the rescue plane's view. The control tower demanded a status update and informed Lieutenant Hoover that Taylor's aircraft had disappeared. At that moment, Taylor's voice crackles through the radio. Delight. Where am I? 
I see other planes, ships sinking. What place is this? The sky is ablaze. The control tower attempted to make contact. The message was garbled, yet Taylor's signal was unmistakably clear, uninterrupted as if transmitting on a superior frequency. At the military base, Hoover, seated beside the communications team, glanced sideways to catch Hartman's expression, one of sheer disbelief. Hoover then met his gaze and declared, It's happening. They've entered the Bermuda Triangle. The rescue aircraft reported over the radio that Taylor's plane had completely vanished from view. The control tower urged them to stay in the area, but just then, communication cut off entirely. Moments passed and an eerie silence fell. The radar no longer shows the rescue plane, and Taylor's aircraft is nowhere to be found. Shock spread throughout the base. Hoover was in disbelief. Phones continued to ring, yet a hushed silence dominated. The lieutenant watched the radar, waiting for a blip, any sign, but none came. Clutching the radio, he suddenly convulsed and collapsed from his chair. Hartman rushed to his aid, calling out, Help! Doctors, help! The radio crackles to life once more. Taylor's voice emerges. Is this help? 